Spindles often have square sections and round sections. The transition between these two is called a pommel. When you're turning a spindle with a pommel, you want to begin with turning the pommel, start with a square blank, and begin by marking the length of the pommel. I like to do that with a saddle square. and mark all four sides of the blank. Now when the piece rotates, you can see your lines. With the pommel marked, we can begin by rolling a small bead between the two lines. It's best to start with a large skew using the long point or the toe. Start with the skew tilted slightly to the left handle low, and then raise the handle while rolling slightly well into your waste material. After you've made the first cut, proceed to the left, making successive cuts deeper and closer to your pencil lines. As you approach your pencil lines, stop and check your progress. You want the pommel to begin on the corner of the blank at your first pencil line and become round at the second pencil line. Once this is complete, you can round the rest of the blank. You want to accomplish this first in case you make a mistake. You can always flip the blank over and use the other end. Or if both ends happen to be square, you'll have to go to plan B change the shape, or start with another piece. With the pommel completed, you can rough down the rest of the blank into a cylinder. Use a spindle roughing gouge and work from the pommel towards the tailstock. You can check your progress on the back side of the piece, feeling if it's round. As you begin working closer to the pommel, turn your roughing gouge on its side. You utilize the corner of the tool to work closely to the pommel without touching the corners. Because of the uniform shape of a spindle roughing gouge and its square grind on the end, you can work in any direction with the tool turned rolled in any direction. So even though the tool is rolled to the left, I can still cut to the right and I can flip the tool over and still work to the right. And as you approach the pommel, oftentimes I begin cutting right to left. Again, utilizing the corner to work right up to the pommel I cut without touching. And with that, you've got a cylinder 
turned on this end, cleanly cut pommel with no tear out. At each transition on a spindle, there's a critical dimension or the diameter at that point. When making multiple spindles, it's a good idea to make a story stick to mark the lines, then use calipers to set the diameters at each one of those points. I've made a story stick for the table leg that we're making today. Simply a scrap block of wood, cut a notch on the end so it hooks over the end. This ensures that I get an accurate measurement off the end of the blank every time. Then I'll use my pencil at these notches I made on the bandsaw for each of my lines. With the piece rotating, simply hold the piece up, hook it on the end, And that ensures that the lines are the same on every piece. Then at each one of these points, there's a dimension or a diameter. I find it best to use vernier calipers to set those diameters. You can use the old-fashioned spring-type calipers. I typically find these a little unreliable because the dimension can change a little bit over time and you may not notice it. Plus, you need a ruler around to set their dimension. With a, with a pair of vernier calipers, the scale's built right in, and I can easily see if it's changed over time. I'll begin with a parting tool at my first point. Simply raising the handle, I also like to write those dimensions on my story stick so I can remember what they are. Work slowly and check your progress as you go. Perfect. Now I'll repeat that for the diameters at each of the other points. And with that, I've got the diameter at each point. With the dimensions set at each point, I'll make some V-cuts, both to remove waste around the bead and for some actual V-shapes that are in the finished piece. This middle section here is a bead. I'll mark a center line. Here I have the skew tip just slightly to the left, simply raising the handle, produces a straight line, V down to the bottom, tip it to the right to cut the right side, tip it to the left to cut the left.
make sure that you don't roll the tool any. Rolling pr produces a curve. Simply raising the handle will give you a straight line. To produce the bead, I'll start at the top of the bead, the flute of the spindle detail gouge flat, then I will roll while raising the handle to create a curve. Each successive cut getting closer to my pencil line. Rolling and raising, which just removes the corner. Same thing on the opposite side, but rolling in the opposite direction. Now I'll produce a cove. This middle section of waste. If I have a large waste section, I'll use either a parting tool or a roughing gouge. Just to remove the excess quickly. And then producing the cove, similar to the bead, but the motion is backwards. I start with the flute vertical, and I'm rolling to horizontal, still lifting the handle to change diameters. Anytime a spindle decreases diameter, the tool handle needs to be raised. You make a cove like scooping sand. You scoop down to the bottom and stop. Down to the bottom and stop. Working in this manner ensures that you have no torn grain. And it just takes a little practice to make the two meet in the middle. And if necessary, I may come back with the skew and clean up the V's using the same technique as before, placing the bevel parallel to the cut I want to make, and then raising the handle, cutting with the tip of the tool down to the bottom of the V. This particular spindle has a small fillet here on this end, which I'll use a parting tool. Again, just removing some of that waste. And then going back to the skew, finishing that pommel all the way down to the bottom of that fillet. In keeping with the curve of the pommel, not only am I raising the handle of the tool, but I'm rolling just slightly. Now we've created a bead, a cove, a V on each side, a small flat section or a fillet, joined to the pommel. Now there's just a round over, it's half of a bead, and then the taper of the leg. Since the shape of this piece is that line that I parted to is my largest diameter, and this is my largest diameter down here, I'm gonna use the roughing gouge to remove some of the waste. And to ensure that I don't lose that line that I parted to, I'm going to use the pencil 
to make a line. Then I can cut a smooth cylinder on this end right down to the pencil line. And again, like I said, if you cut away a pencil line just a little bit, re-darken it. Now back to that round over, half of a bead from the pencil line to the bottom of the V. I'll use the spindle detail gouge. Start with the flute horizontal at the top of the bead, rolling the flute over and raising the handle to round over the corner. Then I'll work back to my pencil line. Now back to the spindle roughing gouge to remove a lot of material for the taper of the leg. This leg has a small cove down here on this end, half of a cove. So I'll start well into my waste material, flute vertical, rolling until it's horizontal. And even though I'm not concerned about the waste material, at this point I'll still treat it like a normal cove, work both sides. And then back to the spindle roughing gouge to remove some more of that waste. Since the diameter changes and gets smaller, we want to work downhill from large diameter to small. And just like working with the pommel, if I roll the tool to the right, then I can use the corner to work very closely to that cove. So with the taper almost complete, it's a good idea, idea to check your progress with a straight edge to find out if this truly is tapered in a straight line or if it has a curve. I just use a ruler and I can easily tell that it rocks back and forth. I can see light between it in several places. It's not very straight, it has quite an arch to it. And I want this one nice and straight. So I'll use my ruler as a gauge to make sure that it's completely flat. Just removing from the high spots. When you're making long tapers like this, you want to make the motion with your body shifting your weight on your feet, keeping the tool up against your side. That'll help keep the motion straighter, more even. Looks real good. With a spindle completely turned, it's time to sand it. Now I'll give you a few tips about sanding one. First, remove the tool rest, safety first. Then I prefer using paper-backed sandpaper instead of cloth. Cloth tends to roll over the details and you lose these crisp edges you worked so hard to create. With the paper folded, then I can easily hold the paper tight between my fingers. 
tuck down into those tight details. Still roll over the curves without any loss in detail. It's also a good idea to do all the crisp details first while your paper is still fresh, has a nice crease in it, and can stick down in those tight areas. Once you've done all the details, then you can fold and curve your paper, fit down into coves and do broad sections. And you can sand underneath if you like or over the top. So when you're sanding across the grain, oftentimes you get these coarse lines. And it's just the grit of the paper going across the grain. It's no different than taking any board and sanding against the grain. So to prevent that, just stop the lathe, sand those areas by hand, working with the grain. And that's about ready for finish. The pommels you'll want to sand by hand. Trying to sand them while the lathe is rotating is dangerous with the corners. Plus, you'll end up rounding over the corners. They won't look crisp anymore. So just work with the grain, with the lathe not rotating, and work around all four corners. So as you can see with a few simple steps, Every spindle is simply beads, coves, V's, all put together to create a shape. All you gotta do is take it one step at a time.